Let's talk about guilt, shame, and second arrows as parents raising PDA children and teens. So recently I shared in Instagram stories um, the concept of a second arrow in Buddhism. So I wanna share that with you guys here on this live. Hi everybody and illustrate some of the primary, quote, second arrows that came up from your um, reactions to the question in Instagram, because these are themes I also see in my coaching, in the Paradigm Shift program, and in my life. So we're going to normalize it, we're going to talk about it, and I'm going to give you some insights into how I use Buddhist psychology in order to deal with the second arrows in my life, and then we'll have a little bit of time for questions. So what do I mean by the second arrow? So let's talk about it. So the first arrow is just the experience of pain that exists in our human lives. And it's particularly acute for many of us because we're raising a child with a nervous system disability whose primary accommodation is our nervous system. So there's gonna be a lot of first arrows, especially because not many people understand our children and there's a lot of potential for pain and suffering, right? So let's do some examples. Let's say your child gets excluded from school and they're feeling sad and upset and it's impacting their self-concept, right? They're like, why can't I be in school? But it's the school who's excluded them. So the first arrow is the pain we feel as parents watching our children suffer, right? But then in comes the second arrow, which is when we make ourselves wrong for what happened and blame ourselves or have guilt because of the way we, we've reacted, right? So second arrow thoughts might be, this is my fault, I should have advocated harder, there's something I could do to prevent this, I'm not a good mother or father, right? So that's when the suffering comes in because the second arrow is what we're shooting at ourselves on top of the pain that we're feeling, right? Another example is, your teen has reached nervous system burnout, right? And they're hiding in their room most of the time and they don't really want to interact with you. You know, you feel like you don't have an opportunity to support them with the connection. They won't let you talk to them. They won't let you get go into their room. They're mostly on screens. However, at night when they're in their non 24 hour sleep cycle, they want to climb into bed with you, wake you up throughout the, throughout the night and it's when they want to connect, right? So maybe you're exhausted, you've been worried all day because your kids, your teen's not leaving their room, they're in burnout, they're not going to school, and so you're emotionally depleted and you're climbing into bed at 11, maybe 12, and they're still up. And then at one in the morning, they're coming into the room wanting to connect and snuggle, etc. okay? So the first arrow is the worry and the pain and watching your child go through nervous system burnout, which is extremely painful as parents, right? But then in comes the second arrow because when your child, your teen climbs into bed, you're thinking to yourself, oh, this is the last thing I want to do is be awake and connecting at one in the morning, two in the morning. You know, I don't want someone else in my bed. And then you feel really guilty because it's like, well, this is the only time I can connect with them and I should be doing more and I should want to do this, right? So that second arrow is the making yourself wrong and the guilt that comes from your human emotions, thoughts, and your own nervous system reactions by making those wrong about yourself, okay? So that's what I mean by the second arrow. So when I was looking at what you guys responded to the question of like, what is your second arrow? The primary theme that came up was guilt, right? Guilt for the nervous system reactions you had, the emotions you felt, and the thoughts that went through your mind on top of what's going on. So I wanna talk about four primary sources of guilt. One, guilt that you caused PDA or that you could be, do some, be doing something better 
or in a more intense way to prevent all activation in the nervous system. Two, guilt about siblings and the impact of your PDA child or children's behavior and needs on your si the siblings. Three, guilt about your own nervous system reactivity, whether you're just exhausted, burned out, anxious, or have a nervous system disability yourself and our PDA. And then fourth, guilt about the grief, resentment, resentment and anger you feel about the fact that you are raising a child with a disability or a teen with a disability and feeling that you shouldn't feel that way. So these are the four primary second arrows of guilt that I want to talk about and then bring a small tool from Buddhism for you so that you can bring self-compassion and not beat yourself up and suffer more on top of what you're already going through. And these are things that I felt and lots of parents feel and that I grapple with as well. Okay, so the first is guilt that you caused PDA or guilt that you caused trauma for your PDA child or both. Okay, so I have certainly felt this and it's specifically, I have felt that I created trauma with my son, especially around eating, which is his stickiest basic need, and through my strict and traditional parenting, pre-burnout, not understanding the mechanisms and root causes of his behavior, okay? So what did I do when, when he was, you know, three, four, moving into continually escalated behavior, more defiant, more oppositional, I didn't know he was PDA or neurodivergent, I responded with what the pediatricians and research and books told me to do, which is to have firm and strict consequences and limits and boundaries, right? And actually I started with one, two, three magic and timeouts. So there were actual times where I would put my son in timeout for doing something and hold the door shut so he couldn't get out, right? So what's happening in those moments? He's already in his survival brain and his body is experiencing fight flight, right? So it's driving him deeper into the quote defiant behavior and he's destroying things in the room. He's trying to get out. He's screaming. He's kicking the door and I'm viewing it through he, I need to extinguish this behavior by doing what the pediatrician told me to do. So I'm actually holding the door shut, driving him deeper into fight or flight, which is escalating the behavior. Additionally, on the eating front, he's increasingly not eating. So what am I doing? I'm following all the advice about, okay, he needs to sit at the table. You need to sit with him. You need home cooked meals. You need to have consistent meal times and snack times. He can't eat in between them, so he's hungry enough. And he needs to have consequences. He can't leave the table. He needs to eat whatever I put in front of him or he goes hungry and he doesn't get dessert, okay? So I enforced all of these things. Every time I'm enforcing this, what's happening? I'm activating his threat response and on a subconscious level, he is perceiving that he's going to die. Okay, and his nervous system is reacting. Not only is he having fight flight behavior, but his entire nervous system is increasing his sensory sensitivity, which is what happens when you're in panic mode. And he's actually starting to vomit and gag because his tactile and like taste and smell sensitivities are exacerbated. Okay, so this is all from things that I did right? Like these were choices I made. These were things I did. And what happened? It completely ruptured our relationship. He moved into nervous system burnout, which he was already moving into because I had had another baby and I wasn't able to provide complete one-on-one -on -one attention like I had intuitively done before my second child. And third, I completely traumatized him around his relationship with food, something that four plus years later, we're still digging out of, right? There were two years in there 
where he only ate literally popcorn and pirate's booty and I was not sure how he was growing and getting enough caloric intake, okay? So I have experienced this guilt of like, I caused his trauma, right? And the pattern I see when working with hundreds of families is that this is often the case, right? Where without knowing, we're either putting our children into a school, usually a public school, and that's what like starts the nervous system burnout just because of the structure of school itself. Not because the teachers are bad, not because school is bad, but because it's just a system that presents constant losses of autonomy and equality, which sets off the nervous system. Second, children who get diagnosed with ADHD or autism earlier on are put in behavioral modification programs or applied behavioral therapy which then leads to burnout because the entire premise is reward sanctions. You know, you're trying to ensure that they comply and have certain behaviors, which is just activating that survival brain or like me parenting, right? So there is this causality that is present for all of us, whether it's the decision to put your kid in ABA because that's what the doctor told you to do once you got an autism diagnosis, the putting your child in public school because that's what you do (laughs) or because you're told to parent in a certain way and you know you're told if your child has this really difficult behavior you need to be stricter with consequences okay so this guilt that you caused trauma is profound and ever present for parents like us so The thing I do want to clarify, though, is that you did not cause PDA, okay? You did not cause your child's neurotype. You did not cause them to have an autistic regression. You merely did not know or understand how your child's nervous system worked, and therefore they had an accumulation of nervous system activation that over time tipped them past their threshold, and then they went into burnout or got close to it, okay? And that's what allowed you, whether your child is 18 or four, to see the truth of their situation and your situation. And there's no way you could have known, okay? So one thing that I bring from like yoga and my Buddhist practice is the concept of like, you can begin fresh at any moment, right? And like, When I meditate, for example, my mind is like the most ridiculous cesspool and whirlpool of negative thoughts, right? Like intrusive thoughts constantly going off in a million directions. And one of the things that's helped me about meditation and also yoga is this concept of like, we just return, right? We just notice like, oh, there's a thought or thought form and then we just return to a baseline of like feeling where our body is in space or we fall out of a yoga pose and we get back in, right? So I use this mantra of you can begin fresh at any moment on a macro scale of like, you know, maybe I'm like not accommodating as much as I should be. I'm not dedicating as much one-on-one attention as I feel like I could because I'm really trying to grow my business and support parents. And then I'm just like, I can begin fresh at any moment, right? Or in a day, like if you're reactive and something happens, rather than shooting yourself with a second arrow and making yourself bad, knowing that it's human and we can begin fresh at any moment, okay? The second source of guilt that came up from you guys, and I understand deeply, (laughs) is guilt about the impact of raising a PDA child or teen on siblings, okay? Whether this is equalizing or destructive behavior towards the sibling directly, or the amount of time, energy, finances that you must allocate in order to totally accommodate your PDA child or teen as having a nervous system disability, right? So this has certainly been true in my family. This has been a source of guilt and a second arrow for me as well. And feel free to tap the heart if you identify with this, where you're 
feel deeply guilty about the impact on siblings, okay? So I'm going to tell you guys a little story and the like second arrow thought I had <laughs> when my children were younger. So my, my older son, my PDA son Cooper was about six and yeah, I see a lot of you guys tapping the hearts because this is a big one, right? And um, my younger son, William, was two. So six and two. This is the heart and in the throes of nervous system burnout. We had just moved to Michigan. I was a full-time caregiver, okay? And I was doing bedtime by myself with both of them. And I was giving them both a bath upstairs. And my husband wasn't home because he was you know, out doing work that he had to do because he had an intense job. And so I didn't have a choice. Like I had to get both of them in bed, right? And I remember trying to wrangle them out of the bathtub and the two-year-old got out before my PDA son, which we all know immediately activates that nervous system because it's like, oh, the two-year-old is above because they're first, right? <laughs> they they get to do something first. So they're like, not equal to and the two year olds above the PDA child, which immediately sets off the threat response and fight flight. And at this time, my son was so close to his threshold all the time, something like that would set him off into violent fight flight behavior, right? So my two year old has gone into his room into my PDA son's room which is another loss of autonomy and making him feel like he's below the two-year-old because he didn't consent to the two-year-old going in the room. But he's a toddler, so he's like running around and naked, you know? And so I'm trying to be like, William, can you please go in your room? He's not listening. And my PDA son gets out of the tub completely naked. He falls on the ground, hurts himself, but barrels towards my two-year-old and like shoves him over and I'm physically separating them and both of them are screaming and I'm like, and it's like a homing device, right? You guys know this, when there's a limit set, the, PD, the especially young PDA or who's near burnout is gonna like, it's like a magnet. If the limit is don't touch your brother, it's gonna be a fixation on touching your brother. And I remember feeling as a mother, like how, can how can families survive this like how can everybody stay alive how can evolutionarily speaking families continue on like how do they survive this and I truly like I told my husband when he came home of course I was like devastated and distraught and traumatized like I don't understand how families stay alive like how do they do this right and that's like at the crux of my work here with you guys, because I was like, I am traumatizing my younger, the younger sibling and I can't keep him safe and I'm a terrible mother. And I was just like shooting myself with these second arrows, right? And so one of the things that I've had to work on and we work on in the paradigm shift program together over and over and over again because it's not easy is radically accepting what's true right so there are two things that are true three things that are true in situations like this one I have a child with a disability okay that's the truth two because I have a child with a disability, it will impact the other child. Even if this was another disability where like the expression of the disability wasn't behavioral and targeting my other child, raising a child with a disability impacts siblings, full stop, right? Like, and, and I've thought about this a lot and look to the other way outside of neurodiversity communities to think about like disability, right? Like when you have a child with a disability, for example, you know, a child in a wheel, wheelchair or if they're deaf or blind or whatever it is, there's going to need to be a lot more accommodations, attention and support to that child. That's just the way it is, right? And it does impact siblings. But that is not something we can change, right? That's what we're radically accepting here. And when we radically accept that that's true, 
instead of trying to make it different, right? Like what should I be doing to make this not happen, right? Whereas we can radically accept this is part of the disability and it will impact the sibling. By radically accepting that constraint, we can actually start to transcend it because as soon as we stop trying to change what we can't change, then we can start to create movement and focus on the other areas where we might have more control. Okay, so for my family, one of the things that we had to do was set up structurally how to separate the kids more, right? Like, because I couldn't stop it. Like, I couldn't stop the physical aggression against my two kids, against my younger son, who, by the way, fifth birthday today. Feel really excited about that. And <laughs> for a long time, I was very worried about his trauma. Um, and I remember watching his little body whenever he heard Cooper's voice or when Cooper would come home from um, being somewhere else and I would watch him. Like I would watch him have a startle reflex. He would go into hypervigilance and he would just completely change his demeanor. And this was another thing that I had to radically accept. And part of my cost benefit decision making, which is something I teach in the Paradigm Shift program, we have a whole framework for it. Like I may need to figure out a way to separate these kids because it's not safe, right? And so then we get to the third type of guilt because the decision we made was actually to set up infrastructure to mostly keep our kids apart, including holidays, including vacations, including weekends. And I do know that some of you, you know, there's different structural constraints for households, right? Some of you are single parents. Some of you have partners who have big jobs and are traveling all the time and you're a sole care caregiver. Your constraint may be different than mine, but the concept is the same. Radically accepting the constraints so that over the long term, we can, we can transcend them. That's the like takeaway from Buddhism <laughs> that I'm sharing on that point. Okay, so third, the separating the kids brings up a lot of grief. It's brought up resentment, it's brought up anger, and it's brought up pain right? Where it's like, I'm pissed off that my kids can't have a holiday together. I'm pissed off that, you know, I can't have a Christmas morning with all both of my children and that I can't spend my holidays with my husband. That freaking sucks, right? So at its core, these are the human emotions that we feel because of the trade-offs that are present with raising a child with a nervous system disability. So this narrative that I think is misguided about if you feel grief about raising a child who's neurodivergent, then you are grieving the living child. That is not my perspective. Why? Because to me, the cost benefit decision-making and trade-offs you make are part and parcel to accommodating and recognizing that your child has needs. And there's grief there, okay? Let me give you an example. Small trade-offs. My house is always messy. It's disorganized. It doesn't look nice. I don't have things framed. I don't have all my kids, like, pictures and all the things that they've drawn and binders that I don't have, like, baby books. I just haven't been able to do that, right? Why? Because I'm choosing to accommodate my PDA son most of the time with one-on-one -on -one attention and therefore there's a trade-off, a cost. And I have grief about that, okay? My house is dark most of the time when my kids are home. Why? Because they have sensitivity to light. I hate living in the dark. I can't see anything. I'm an old woman, right? These are small trade-offs. <laughs> and every time I'm in my living room and you know, near the TV room, it's like two different YouTubes going on full blast, okay? And I freaking hate it. I freaking hate it. I'm like someone who, when I was in my doctorate program, what did I love doing? I literally spent like 10 hours a day reading, writing, and in libraries. And if I wasn't there, I was in a yoga class, okay? So like, I do not like lots of noise and lots of like, pinging and bright lights like that's not me I'm not a dopamine seeker in that way 
but I have accepted these small trade-offs and I'm allowed to have grief about it because it's actually a reflection of the fact that I'm accommodating my kid. I wouldn't have grief if I didn't change my life and I was just going off and doing the same thing that I was before. There's nothing to grieve because I'm not adjusting my life, right? So I don't get this narrative about like, you know, you're a bad parent because you're there's grief with your autistic child. Like, I don't think that captures what's actually going on. Second, large trade-offs. The type of career you can have if you're accommodating, right? If you're lowering demands, providing autonomy, and allowing your child to like sometimes be above you, you're not going to be able to get to work on time, right? If, you, if your child needs one-on-one -on -one attention all the time and, and like, has to leave from school or has like can only access partial days both parents can't have the professional careers that they wanted to have that's just a fact again constraints right so like you're allowed to feel grief about that you're allowed to feel resentment and making yourself wrong about that is the second arrow and that's where the suffering comes in not leaving the house right like parents especially in burnout, like when you when you want to leave the house and there's a cost, like if you go out to have coffee with your friend, there's a cost to your child's nervous system because you're the primary accommodation. You're robbing Peter to pay Paul. This is super grievy and it brings up resent, resentment and it brings up anger, okay? In my opinion, this is all a natural human response to the fact that you're making trade-offs to support your child. Okay? Splitting the kids. Grief. Grief. And so here's the thing. Instead of making yourself wrong and feeling shame and like being in circles in the neurodiversity <laughs> space that are going to make you wrong for having these feelings, what we can do is we can bring Buddhist principles again to this and know I am a divine human light that can never be corrupted. My thoughts, my emotions, and my nervous system reactions are not who I am, okay? And instead of avoiding or denying that this is going on, I can observe without judgment that this is what's coming up for me and let it pass through, okay? Because anyone, and I get this comment a lot and I really don't like it and I will delete it. Like I won't block you, but I'll, I'll delete it because I think it's wrong. <laughs> um, it sounds like you're grieving a living child and it's just this like knee jerk reaction. And actually I think when people project that onto my page, I'm like, they're denying the grief that they feel when they've had to make all these trade offs in their life and they're pissed off about it. And so they're commenting on my page. Okay, finally, guilt about your own reactivity. Okay, this is a big one. Whether you're PDA, whether you're autistic, ADHD, highly sensitive nervous system, anxious, or neurotypical. All of us have nervous system activation around our kids. Why? Because they're having a nervous system response and we're wired to respond when we see the people we love in pain and suffering. And what is pain and suffering? It's like the sounds, the movements, the facial expressions, the all the expressions of what your child's body would do if they were like getting attacked by a lion. So like, of course, you're going to have nervous system reactivity. Okay. So two things, like one thing that I work on is recognizing the first step, recognizing the activation, right? Like I feel pain in my chest or my hands are tingling, or like I'm starting to see double vision and disassociating, right? And it's like observing that without judgment of like, okay, this too, like this is part of my human experience. And remembering that even if your nervous system is a very integral part of your human experience, which it is for me, right? I've been diagnosed with panic disorder. I've been diagnosed with OCD. I have had panic attacks since I was 26 and it was debilitating to me and I've had nervous system burnout more than once and I have a history of disassociation, okay? So this is something I work on a lot 
even if I don't identify as PDA or autistic, it does not mean that as a human, I don't experience a life that is very defined by my nervous system physical reactions, okay? And this is true for you as well. So you are not those reactions. That's not who you are. It's something that you experience, right? And so we don't need to make ourselves wrong for having those sensations, right? And sometimes we act on them because we're human, right? And so again, we go back to the other concept of you can begin fresh at any moment, right? We don't need to shoot ourselves with a second arrow. So that is my coffee with Casey on the guilt, shame, and second arrows that we feel as parents of PDA children and teens. And at least what I hope for you guys is this plants a seed to reduce the unnecessary suffering that comes from making ourselves wrong for our human experience, okay? So feel free to drop a heart if this resonates for you. Um, and I will turn it into a podcast so you can listen on your way to get groceries. And I have about 10 minutes. I actually have to go to my son's school, um, the younger one, for his Montessori birthday celebration. And my husband and I have to get um, some treats. So I only have about 10 more minutes before I have to head to his school. So I'm just going to scan through some of the questions. I talked for a long time. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm in the UK. How would I approach starting to find diagnostic services? Where to start? So I really love the PDA Society. They're a great charity in the, in the UK. I actually spoke with the research director yesterday to make the contact as we move into more research. So I would start there. For those of you in the US, PDA North America is the main resource for more vetted um, practitioners. Conflicting ideas. Okay, so Meg's, Meg Mace says, conflicting ideas. I hear about kids in burnout who stay in their room all day for months, but I've also heard you talk about PDA kids always want need co-regulation and presence, especially in current. Okay, so... Yeah, it depends on the kid. I mean, I think the trends would be younger kids tend to seek being in the space with their parents or the lead parent because even though they like their brain perceives threat when they don't have autonomy, their baseline of always feeling threat means they want constant presence and signals of nervous system safety from the parent. Right? It's both related to the, the root cause of the nervous system constantly reacting. What I'm saying about um, the burnout when they're in their room, it often happens when they're a little bit older, like 11 or older, right? When they're developmentally seeking nervous system safety from like peers more, they might be on video games, they might be you know, doing TikToks, they might be seeking it through more peer networks on online. So it depends on the age of the kid. It depends on, you know, is this an internalized expression or externalized expression? So I wouldn't say they're conflicting ideas. I think they're just different expressions of the same thing, right? Seeking nervous system safety, but the way that the child is doing it can, can differ, right? Yeah, there's no, like, every PDA kid looks like this. Feeling so lost. Punk Pixel says, feeling so lost. Nine-year-old coming out of burnout. Stays in room watching iPad all day. Don't know whether to allow this to continue and wait for him to come out of burnout. Not in school. Okay, so I completely understand that feeling of, like, you know, is this what I should be doing? And like, there's often a degree of trial and error and data collection that we have to engage in no matter what part of this process there is. So an observation, not a prescription, but an observation that I often share with parents is that there are generally four states that are regulating to a PDA child or teen. One is another safe nervous system. 
two is screens, three is dopamine, sensory intense experiences, and um, novelty. And then fourth is a special interest. And often in burnout, we can really only see how the first two are working or even just screens. But as your child starts to come out of burnout, what we want to start doing is trying to strew alternatives to, to screens that regulate the nervous system in a very patient and slow way so that we're moving more into connection with you through these other three states. So that's the framework that I would think through as you're experimenting with with potential um, alternatives to screen. So we, so instead of thinking it through like, should I set a limit on screens? We want to think, how can we create a scenario that's as regulating or even more regulating as the screens when they get off the screen? So it sort of like gently provides an opportunity that's not the screen. Okay, so I saw more than one question about that. Is it possible for reward systems to work? My son seems to like getting treats at school with his people tickets. So I think that every, this is how I view things. Like, I don't view rewards and sanctions as bad, right? Like, I'm someone who likes rules, <laughs> or did in my previous life. I like structure, I like routine. I even like, you know, working towards a goal and getting rewarded for it and having disincentives, you know, like that's sort of how I grew up, I operated, I was fine with it, right? And, you know, a lot of my friends and family are raising beautifully regulated and lovely children through more traditional parenting, right? So it's not like this is wrong, this is right. The question becomes what works for your child. And from my experience coaching and working with hundreds of families and raising my own PDA child, what happens with reward systems often, even if they consent to them initially or even collaborate on them with you, it often ends up, once it loses its novelty, it can end up becoming an internal demand or an, or sort of a like loss of autonomy in the structure itself. So a pattern that we often see even when reward systems are adapted and even come up with, with the PDA child or teen, they're often eventually becoming a source of activation and, and then the accommodation becomes allowing them to drop it, right? So my son often sets up chore charts for himself, but I don't get attached to it, right? And he might drop it entirely. So, and we also want to like think carefully about what work means, right? Because yes, like, especially if there's a degree of masking or wanting to please the teacher and participate, yes, they will comply. But because this is happening on a subconscious level and a nervous system physiological level, they may be complying on the surface and still experiencing that nervous system activation inside of them. Then they come home and equalize against a sibling or start having trouble with like eating or toileting or sleeping. So we want to look very carefully at what work means and and only I only you can answer that, right? And like like everything, PDA kids are on a distribution, right? Like our you know, a normal distribution is like this of like all kids and our kids are like super outliers. But then within that group of kids and teens, there's also a distribution and outliers. So I never want to say like don't ever do this, right? And it's not my decision, it's your decision. But I just want to make clear some of the mechanisms and the patterns I've seen so that you can make informed decisions and not mistake compliance for what's actually going on in the nervous system because those are the moments that in accumulation can impact things like basic needs and, and behavior at home, right? Okay. 
I have noticed my daughter has got worse and more clingy, clingy since becoming a low demand household about seven weeks ago. Yeah, so what you might be seeing, and again, tune in to like whether this is resonating, is that as we start to accommodate more and see our kids clearly and understand them on a deeper level, there is an energetic shift within us and there's also a shift in how they neurocept what's going on, which means not consciously perceive things, but on a subconscious level, like the brain is like, oh, I'm safer now. So instead of masking or internalizing that threat, they're going to express it more. You're going to see it more, right? Because your child may have needed more one-on-one -on -one attention, undivided attention, signals of nervous system safety from you, but her subconscious brain may not have perceived that as completely safe. So I would actually view it as an indicator that like there's more felt safety. And I know that that goes against some of the like attachment theory stuff of like clingy indicates an insecure attachment. I actually don't view it that way for our unique children. But again, you want to understand, like, are we doing the attachment lens? Are we doing the sensory processing lens? Are we doing the PDA lens, right? And like, I'm never going to tell you one is wrong or right. I'm just giving you the logic and clarity so that you can apply it to your own life and see clearly and make decisions that support peace in your home and for you as a parent. Okay, I'm going to answer one more question and then I got to run. Two wild boys. I have a question about the paradigm shift program. Can I email to ask? Yes, of course. So I have um, an admin that will answer all your questions and you can also sample the program, any of you. If you join the wait list, uh, you get automatically sent what's called the taste of the paradigm shift program. And you get to have the first eight videos of like, how it works, what the 5A framework is, which is our trademarked framework that we walk parents through in the signature program, and then six episodes of the members only podcast. So you can really like sample it and see if it's the right fit for you. So that's using the link in my bio if you want to just like get it right now. And that will be available until um, like December 15th, but the first day to enroll to waitlist only is December 11th. And as soon as it fills up, we're going to close it. So I would sample it now if, if it's of interest to you and, and to give yourself some time to, to play around in there. Okay. So I have to run. It was so good to be with you guys. I hope that the conversation about guilt, shame, and second arrows was supportive. Um, and I will see you in a week. All right. Bye.